Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Keynes with Gold Silver Pros at www.goldsilverpros.com. And it is Thursday, April 4, 2024. And a long awaited and as promised uh, presentation on spot products that I promised that I would give last week. I've been working on this for a while. Lots of data in here, lots of analysis about spot price. But the whole point of this presentation today is to walk you through what the spot price for gold and silver bullion is and what the spot price for gold and silver bullion is not. Uh, some likely outcomes as a result of this research, as well as uh, maybe some conclusions about where we're going to go. And some caveats for you as you participate in the market and what you want to look for. You have to be very careful uh, when buying your products, buying and selling your products in the market as to what other people are going to pay, what other people are going to charge. And I'm going to prove to you that despite the fact that we have a national spot price, that largely in addition to spot price, the premiums that you buy and sell at are locally determined and not necessarily nationally determined. And we're basically going to uh, prove that as much as humanly possible with data. One of the reasons I wanted to do this presentation is there seems to be a lot of misconceptions about how prices go for gold and silver, why they rise, why they fall, when they rise, when they fall, why products are priced differently, why you can go to different dealers, both online and locally, and get different premiums on things and different rates on different things. There are all reasons for that. So it's basically to educate on what we believe to be the truth based on available data versus debunking some common myths about how prices are actually determined. And as I become a dealer and been closer to the ground and closer to the public on this part of the conversation, uh, both uh, positively on, on how people are, are approaching the market and also negatively on how on things that people think they're true that aren't true, um, you know, I wanted to, to do this presentation to kind of explain how it all really works. So this is the truth on spot pricing and premiums in the gold and silver market, given uh, our understanding of the markets and the best data that we have available. One caveat, we don't have all the data. And that's one of the points I'm going to use to prove to you that spot price means butt kiss with regards to actual supply and demand, especially locally. Uh, but we do have some data for you on that, and we're going to go through it. So without further ado, let's jump into the presentation. This presentation is called Spot Pricing and the Bullion Market by Gold Silver Pros. And let's jump right into it. So essentially, what is spot really? Well, it's believed to be and is the widely quoted but wholly misunderstood price for gold and silver bullion. What's gold and spot price today? Well, at the time that I'm doing this video, as I look on Kitco's app, gold is at $22.90 and 50 cents and silver is at $26.92. And that's at about 1.30 p.m. Central Time on Thursday, April 4, 2024. But is that really the price of gold and silver? And is spot really should spot be the center of the universe when it comes to gold and silver dealing in the retail market or even in the industrial market? Well, I've got issues with that, but let's get into the presentation. You'll see the spot price everywhere. It's quoted everywhere. But do you know what really goes into it? Do you really, really know? Well, this presentation is aimed at educating you on that because from speaking with you guys uh, all the time via email, social media, in the store, at conferences, out you know, in the wild when I get recognized and people want to engage me in these sometimes hour-long conversations, you guys really don't know what goes into the spot price or what even goes into the premiums above or below spot. We're going to try attempt to um, educate you on that and sort of make that a little bit more clear for you, for those of you that don't know. Do you know how it affects the pricing actual physical gold and silver? We discuss all those things in this presentation. If you believe the conventional wisdom, spot price is the intersection of pricing for both gold and silver across the American COMEX exchange and the UK LBMA markets. This information is collected by the banks that trade in both markets and distributed to dealers and wholesalers and website and everybody via electronic interface. It's all electronic now, uses uh, application programming interfaces for the most part, or you can just download an app and eyeball it if you, you're on the retail end and you just want to know what it is at a point in time. But for everybody buying and selling in the market, we all got to grab it electronically because that spot price can move a thousand times a day because it's based on something called uh, the paper derivatives market, which I'll explain. All the market participants quote market participants quote it when talking about gold and silver. That includes wholesalers, dealers, refineries, news media, industrial and retail buyers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is a difference, however, between uh, the U.S. price and the U.K. price, which we'll go over here by looking at this. All right. So resuming the presentation, there are differences between Comex and LBMA. So the reason why uh, there are uh, differences in the markets is 
they're, they're different markets. LBMA is an unallocated market that works very much in an opaque way in which a lot of papers trade. It's very private information. It's very hard to get trading information off of it. The COMEX has more information, but it's more of a futures and an options market. So the models are different and the markets are different. And this is the easiest way sort of at a top down level to explain why you're going to get different pricing across the world. There is an arbitrage opportunity between the U.S. and the U.K., even though there's similar uh, market systems and there's supposed to be um, sister markets that kind of work together and have some products that you can move back and forth, such as exchange for physicals, which we won't get into in this program. But if you watch our Tuesday video, we talk about exchange for physicals all the time. Even though these are sort of sister markets, there has been increasingly price differentials between those two. And so that basically goes to prove that when you're looking at spot price, which the banks take into account both across the pond and over here uh, rates, it really is not the same between the two countries. And as we'll see as we drill down the data, it's not the same between vendors and it's not the same in localities. Uh, and that's kind of uh, at the very top level a way to explain that prices are different everywhere. And spot itself is an amalgamation of a couple of different markets that doesn't necessarily reflect what you're seeing in your locale or even in your state or even in your country. Um, but that's basically a good chart to illustrate that as we continue to move on the presentation. What spot is not, it does not reflect the majority of actual physical transactions in either the industrial or the retail bullion markets. And we're going to show that throughout the presentation. More specifically, Spot reflects mostly paper contract trading in the U.S. Uh, the paper contracts consume 99.9% of all transactions that do not have any physical component, only about 0.1% or less on a given day of the uh, COMEX market is actually physically traded, as well as paper contracts in the U.K. market in an unallocated scheme, different scheme for which we don't even have a lot of data. So we have to trust the data that the banks are giving us because there's very little uh, publicly available data on how that market actually works. So there's some um, opaqueness to how spot price is even determined. And then spot itself does not reflect actual physical trading. It's more of a paper trade across two wholly completely different markets, both of which really have different pricing and both of which don't uptake a lot of physical trade. Now, there is some physical trade supposedly component to the UK being unallocated because you can get physical gold supposedly in COMEX. But a lot of these transactions... Uh, are not based upon actual physical trade. Uh, those markets, especially COMEX, do not uptake data in a systematic and periodic manner on the wholesale and, and retail physical buying from the market to determine bullion prices. How could they? I don't report my data. Does Atmex report their data? Do all of these places report their data to the COMEX? No, that's not a requirement in the industry. So how in the hell do they know what's trading and what's selling and at what prices? The answer is they don't. So spot is not a reflection of the physical market, whether from an industrial perspective or the retail perspective. Here's an example of U.S. spot. This is as of today, earlier today. Now, on a lot of days, I want to point out that there are no physical deliveries. There are only about six months of the year in which you get a substantive amount of physical deliveries for each of gold and silver. And those months can be different with the exception of December, which is the same. The rest of the months, there can be some physical deliveries, but there isn't a lot of trading on the futures market. So those physical deliveries have to be less because to physically deliver, you have to have an open paper trade. So if you have an open paper trade and you want to take possession, you can declare it. But on six months of the year, the paper trading is somewhat muted. It's still there. There could be a lot of paper trading, but there are less overall contracts and it's not considered a delivery month. And in this particular case for today, uh, this is actually, I believe, uh, Wednesday's data. So it was printed today, but it's Wednesday's data on this top line. The total volume of 267,353 contracts traded, only 1,040 of those contracts had a fiscal delivery for a ratio of 0.39%, 0.39%. And again, on a lot of days, there'll be a lot of contracts to trade and there will be 0% delivery. So again, this is not physically determined. This is a paper traded market. Those of you who watch my Tuesday weekly market wrap up, I show this every single week and I go in a lot more detail than I go here. I'm going to save that for those Tuesday videos. All you have to do is go to any of my Tuesday videos and I'll talk about it. But I just wanted to point at the top line that the COMEX market here in the U.S., has very little to do with actual physical trade. And that is a fact. That is a substantiated fact and an undeniable fact, an uncontestable fact. So some conclusions on spot price. Spot prices trade thousands of times per day, but most days they see no deliveries. For each of gold and silver, each of the gold and silver contracts, 
that are traded on the, uh, that paper market, only six months see a substantial amount of deliveries because by design, it's a futures market. It's not a current real-time market. You're betting on the price of those commodities in the future, mostly in a paper format, not in a physical format. In addition, uh, in addition to what we normally talk about, there's also this huge options trading market uh, also in the COMEX. It's very seldom understood, and it adds a very significant paper trading volume onto the metals complex with no substantial, substantive physical trade backing. Uh, those aren't physically delivered at any greater rate than the futures, but it adds a lot more paper on top, which helps determine prices because on options, you're going for a strike price whether you're in or out of the money. And that is uh, takes a lot of demand from the speculative end of the market and also affects prices. Because if you're in the futures market and you're trying and you also have an option, you're trying to hit your options price, you may put in futures contracts to try to hit that that options price or to try to influence that options price. And that occurs quite a bit. Now, on the UK market data, it's not fully publicized, but every analyst I've spoken to that's been in that market or analyzed that market says it's unallocated and contracts are at least 10 times or more leveraged to the actual physical supplies. So even though there are physical deliveries in the UK, a lot of that paper trading exists on top of it that cannot be tied to a specific set amount of gold or silver that is unique to that contract. It is a leveraged market, just like COMEX. All right, we're going to get into part two, the physical market. This is the majority of the slides. There are 25 slides total. The majority go into the physical. There's a lot of data. I'm going to narrate that data. At times, you may want to go back and watch, rewatch sections of this video or pause the video and just kind of stare at it and think, think about it for yourself. But I encourage you to go through this part of the presentation to the end more than one time if you really want to understand, because it's a lot more complex than you may think when you're showing up to your local coin dealer, just buying some gold and silver or selling some gold and silver, or even buying gold and silver jewelry or going online and say, what's the price of gold and silver? It's very complex. So here we go. What determines the prices you will pay online at your local coin dealer? We're going to answer that question. Isn't spot reflecting that local market? We're going to answer that question. We're going to answer the question of if not, how does the market actually price products? How come different products are priced differently? For example, American Silver Eagles versus 10 ounce bars. Why do different retailers charge different prices? Why isn't everybody the same? Spot is one price. Why can everybody, damn it, why can everybody be the same? Why can everybody have the exact same premium at the exact same time all the time? Well, ask yourself the question, why isn't the automobile you bought in Dallas, Texas, the exact same price as you bought in Los Angeles, California, exactly the same price as you bought in New York? Why isn't the price of eggs the same everywhere? Why isn't the price of oil the same everywhere? Why isn't the price of gas the same everywhere? Why isn't the price of jewelry the same everywhere? Well, it's a localized market. We're going to show that through the data or the lack of data. And why do different retailers buy back at different rates? Well, there's a reason for that too. It's supply and demand. We're going to go on throughout this presentation to talk about all of this data in greater detail starting now. And looking at the supply chain for the precious metals markets, we really have two supply chains. And this is simplified because it's not 100% correct in all cases. But these are the two major legs of the supply chain. And for all intents and purposes, is all you really need to know. Um, and the industrial side of the market, you've got the miners who pull the metal out of the ground. The refiners should get it to the point in which you can put it on the major exchanges in a 1,000 ounce bar form in silver or 400 ounce uh, good delivery bars in gold. Uh, the different exchanges across uh, the world, the major ones are COMEX, UK, Shanghai, Dubai, you've got the Indian one, etc. And then it goes to large market participants who can afford to buy a thousand ounce bar or five thousand ounce bars on a contract or one 400 ounce gold bar uh, or, or four 100 ounce COMEX contracts equaling a gold bar if you're going to take delivery. And the retail markets, it's a bit different. It goes miners and refiners, but then it generally goes to the mints. The wholesalers, the retailers, and then the retail buyers, both large and small. So it could be wealthy people buying at a retail level, or it could be just buying one ounce at a time. Uh, the top market is characterized by 1,000-ounce silver bars and 400-ounce gold bars. That's more the industrial side where they're taking big amounts. And the retail market is characterized by thousands of different products from bars to rounds to government coins to collectibles to customized products by thousands of private and public mints. By the way, all of that data in the bottom market is not made available to the derivative market. So they have no idea what it is. So they have no clue what you're buying and selling. Therefore, spot price does not represent fiscal uh, supply and demand. It can't. They don't know what it should be. Moving on. Some basic to knows. 
the industrial market deals with not yet refined products from the mines, which could be a concentrate, which is sort of like a mud, which has gold and silver in it, or Dore bars, which is usually a combination of gold, silver, maybe some other types of metals that need a little bit further refinement before they get to the finish stage where you get the large size bars, which also trade on the industrial markets, especially if you're going to go to the exchange like Comex or a London or those types of things. The retail market takes the bulk metals. Uh, either melts them down or partitions them and mints them into thousands of different products with different markups and in different supplies for different localities. Why? Because you have a bunch of, you have thousands of mints really across the country that supply and they don't always have to ship all the way around the U.S. all the time. They have a lot of local customers. So this is where we begin to see as we go through the distribution pipeline, the further you get to the retail customer, the more the market becomes regionalized or localized and has very little to do with that one big market that determines spot prices in the US and in the UK. The spot price is essentially more related to the industrial market, not the retail market. And again, it's not a heavy delivery market. If you go back up to the slide we had before off of the COMEX from CME Group, uh, it was only 0.39% of deliveries for today, and some days it could be zero. Well, that paper market has very little data with regards to physical deliveries in the retail market because most of those trades are private and you're not going to know what they are. And the further you get down to where uh, you guys are buying the product, those guys that are trading the paper up top have no clue what you're buying or what you're buying at. The paper traders don't know what products will be produced once the metals leave the refiners or in what amount. Not all of which goes through COMEX markets. In any case, there are alternative ways to get the metals. You can buy it straight from the mines. There's the resale market. Uh, there, there's all sorts of ways and all of those feed into what the prices and premiums will be. A lot of that really doesn't go through the COMEX or the UK market. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. But in any case, all that trading data and that pricing data never flows back up to the traders. So again, spot price is not representative of supply and demand. I think we proved that point a bunch of times, but I wanted to emphasize it. Retail selling back to the supply chain also feeds the refiners and wholesalers who resell many of the products that never cross the industrial markets a second time. And that data is largely privately held. And the uh, paper market traders and the industrial market will have no clue uh, what's going on. They may have some high level numbers about the overall amount of scrap and gold and silver, but they don't get a lot of that pricing data. There's a lot of data that they're never going to see that occurs down at the retail level. All right, now we're on to retail premiums. What are retail premiums? Retail premiums basically are the price you pay above or below spot. Spot, again, being a paper derivative price, but when you actually buy a product, there's some sort of premium. What does that premium encompass? We're gonna go through that on this slide. They're calculated on a rolling basis from millions of different distribution points with little to no public data available to anyone. They're affected by, well, retail, which is you watching the show. Remember, supply demand, who's demand? You're a big part of that equation. Not all demand for the for the metal is retail. Some of it's industrial, wholesale, that kind of thing. But you're a huge part when you buy. You affect the prices of things up and down based on what you're buying, either from online or at your local coin dealer or from your friend or wherever you're getting it. Also, uh, it's affected by the supply of each product and the opportunity cost of providing them by the wholesalers and retailers. Because wholesalers and retailers can buy stuff and not sell it and sit on it and that will affect their carrying costs and other costs and their liquidity and things like that. In addition, in the supply chain, at each step of the way, each per, each person or entity has the following. Cost of warehousing, distribution, insurance, rent, utilities, administrative, meaning people and people in process, by the way, computer systems, things like that, paper, anything that you would use. Compliance, because there are compliance laws along the way, anti money laundering, know your customer. Uh, some people have like PCI compliance of these, credit cards and those types of things. Advertising costs and a host of other costs that too long for me to list on this slide. It would be, you know, you know, 100 pages long when we added up all the costs. Well, those costs are at every step of the supply chain. They have to be added in or that part of the supply chain goes out of business and you can't get your metal and you got to go figure out a way to dig it up yourself. That's just a reality of how the supply chain works. Spot price movements for gold and silver are completely independent of final retail demand. Also affect the profit margins. What do I mean? Well, let's say spot price is moving up and down and they don't have the data, so they don't know what you're actually paying uh, or selling it for. And spot price moves up or down based on their bet on where they think the market will go in the next three months, agnostic of any physical trade, either at the industrial or retail level. Well, let's say, you know, I'm a dealer and I buy something, at, I, I buy an ounce of silver at 26 bucks and spot price goes down to 25. Well, I've got to pull that from the shelf or guarantee myself a loss. So where spot prices move also determines what the premiums are. 
uh, at times where price is really high and then it comes crashing down, premiums may have to come down, but a lot of supply may be pulled from the shelf as well because if they sell it, it's a guaranteed loss. And sometimes big, the bigger the business, the more price risk they have because they got to pay employees and they got to pay all their costs. And if they're really big, they have to sell a certain amount of metal no matter what. So they may be dumping metal on the market during thin times, which brings the overall premiums down, which also affects everybody because if you're the smaller guy, then all of a sudden you're going to try to match their prices and you're trading at a loss. And then it leads into market problems, which we'll get into in the following slides. And I'll delineate what that really means as we go further. Here's an example of the bull market. This is a data set from uh, Michael Lynch off of Twitter, which I pulled and added a little bit of information to really just clarification and red text. But this is during a bull market. This is 2008 to 2011. I want to stress this is during a bull market. This is during a bull market. Look at the premiums go up during a bull market, but all the rest of the time when we're not in a bull market, the typical premium is only 2%. 2% is lower than your average grocery store. So when you're in the gold and silver market, most of the time you're not making a lot of data. If you're a wholesaler, uh, a dealer, a miner, a refiner, refiners probably make it, you know, a certain amount on the refining costs. But if there's less demand, they have less volume that affects them because refineries are extremely expensive and capital intensive to set up. So the entire supply chain, most of the time is either trading at a loss or trying to break even and survive. And about 20 percent of the time, they actually have pretty good premiums, as this slide illustrates. Um, and I'll get further into that as we go further along. And it leads to the Pareto principle. What's the Pareto principle? Well, it's a famous principle in business that uh, like 20 percent of your effort leads to 80 percent of your profits. Well, that also or. 80% of your benefit overall, whatever that benefit is. If you're a nonprofit, even 20% of your effort leads to 80% of your benefit as a nonprofit. That's just sort of something we've realized over time. And it's been encapsulated in something called the Pareto principle. Pareto was the person that basically put it into a uh, recognizable form that we all know and that we all learn, especially if you go to business school. Well, the wholesale and dealer markets, which distribute bullion to the retail customer and determines the final premiums, make good money about 20% of the time. The other 80% of the time, they're holding on for dear life. And I'm going to show you some data that shows that. Uh, they're in survival mode. Uh, during these 80% of the time, it requires a lot of excess cash to absorb retail selling. What did we go through the last four or five months? A lot of retail selling. I got to the point where I didn't have much money left in my corporate bank account because I was buying so much stuff. you know. And so you have to have a lot of cash to absorb that or you don't do business. And you're not selling it all back out the door. So you're sitting there holding it going, well, what do I do with all this metal? Do I put it in a vault? You know? You've got carrying costs, insurance costs, all that kind of thing to consider. It results in losses and consolidation in the industry, which I'll illustrate here in a moment with some examples. Uh, not everyone makes it through the lean times. And spot prices often affect the results on future survival with little to no guarantee of payback on metals purchased because spot is determined in a different market. Spots determined in the paper market, not the physical market. So if it's a lean time and the spot price moves against you, you can go out of business very, very easily as a, any sort of distributor or dealer in this space. And it happens all the time. In fact, we had something called the precious metals winter period. Those of you familiar with the crypto world know that we just went through crypto winter where the cryptos, a lot of the cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, crashed. It wasn't great. It was horrible. You had, you know, big scandals like FTX and all that kind of stuff. You know, that happens during a winter period in any market. There's more scandals. There's more losses. There's more bankruptcies. So in gold and silver between 2011 and 2016, Bankruptcies and consolidation within the wholesale and retail markets were very common. The profit margins were very low, which I'll show you some data on here in a moment, resulting in millions of lost dollars. Consolidation tightens up availability distribution points. What that means to you in plain English is there may be less people that can offer you gold and silver or that can buy back your gold and silver at prices that you want to sell at or offer you products at premiums that you want to buy at. In other words, less choice overall when we go through these winter periods. The risk is that the market will eventually move into an oligopoly or mon monopolistic model. And I'm going to show you an example of that here in a moment. Will result likely in much less democratized premium setting in the retail market and therefore less product choice or choice of premium rates on each product for you, the consumer. This also adds fuel to the common retail scams perpetrated on U.S. precious metals consumers, some of which I've covered in a previous video. And a lot of that is pushing you into higher margin products, whether or not you need them, or pushing you into some scheme to hold or uh, charge additional premium or uh, storage fees or whatever the case is. And that doesn't mean in all cases those are bad things. It's just that if people aren't making money in the space, they may try to push you into an area where they can actually make money. And whether or not that fits you, it may not fit you at that period of time. So you may end up paying more for your metals than you realize. So the future of the industry, I think right now, is at a it's it's we're at an inflection point. 
Uh, if we don't educate people on premiums and spot prices and get them to where they understand the market a lot better, retail is going to be taken advantage of by uh, factors in the market. And it's not necessarily always done on purpose. Sometimes it's just a, 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 a result of what's going on in the market where it's just, it, it hurts you uh, through consolidation or control of prices or oligopolies or that type of thing. So very much the future of the industry, you know, hangs in the balance of what happens the next five to 10 years. And I'm going to show you some stuff that happened in the past. For example, bankruptcies are common. I just did a random search on a uh, start page, which uses Google's API. So this is Google data on bankruptcies. And I got pages and pages of bankruptcies. And I know of some, I know inside baseball on quite a few that I happen to know because I've talked to people that were involved in those. But if you just go search Google or any of your search engines for bankruptcies, uh, in the wholesale and dealer space in gold and silver, especially during times that have been tough, like the last six to eight months or 2011, 2016, you'll find that there are tons of them, tons and tons and tons. This is an industry which is so low margin from a percentage standpoint on profit that during the lean times, a lot of people go out of business. Consolidation is common. I'm going to give you one example that's publicly available. It has to do with AMARC. Now, we're not in any way, shape or form throwing shade on AMARC. Congrats to them for picking up what they did and growing and all this good stuff. But we're just showing you an example of what has happened. Uh, and AMARC is just an example here we both pull data from. So one thing I want you to look at is the bottom of the chart. Look at the profit margins in, 25, in 2015, 2016, and 2017. The gross profit margin in 2015 for this big company was 0.4%. How do you survive if you're making 0.4% gross margin? Because you still have to subtract out a bunch of other things, including tax expense. You can't. How do you survive in 2016 if you're only making 0.51? In 2017, 0.45. In 2018, 0.39. In 2019, 0.67. It wasn't until 2020 and all the government shutdowns when you had that raise or that, that steep rise in 2020 on demand for gold and silver and prices rose that they actually started making a decent profit. They're a core example of what happens. 80% of the time, you're not making squat. You're probably losing money. And only 20% of the time, when prices rise and demand rises and premiums rise, can you make any money? A mark is a huge uh, uh, indicator. It's a huge market indicator of exactly what happens. But along the way, A mark was using any money that they had to basically acquire more companies. Why? All of these companies were either going out of business, needed help, needed financing, and A mark had enough money to do it because they were big to begin with. This is consolidation. This is where a lot of outlets that you look at are actually owned by one company. What happens if the entire industry does that? I'm not saying AMARC is causing this, but what happens if this happens to all the big players and they absorb all the small fish and you just have four or five players in the market? You have an oligopoly situation where you could have some price setting, you could have lack of diversity in product portfolios. Overall, for the retail consumer, this is not as good. It's good for the big business, maybe not quite as good for the retail consumer, but there's no choice here because if AMARC didn't get involved, some of these businesses might have gone out of business or they may have had a capital crunches and had to close their doors for a while or sell off inventory to loss, lay off people. You know, this is just what happens during the lean times. And this is a, a primary case of it. And you can see all the data here and all the different companies involved in this to show you that consolidation and bankruptcies are very common during the lean times. Also that profit margins, even for the big players that have tons of product and tons of flow through are extremely lean most of the time. This is not a lie. This is publicly available data. And this is what happens. Precious metals is not a high profit margin business. Despite when you see premium surge on American Silver Eagles or whatever it is, it's only going to do that for a while. And it's only on that product and maybe some other products. And it doesn't fund healthy businesses most of the time. So this is what happened. We have PM winner, just like the cryptos had crypto winner, and it leads to consolidation. Well, what about premiums? Premiums in reality are a function of supply. That's refiners, wholesalers, dealers, and the secondary market that could be you or somebody else pushing product in uh, at the time at which you held it and it wasn't available and demand. And that's industrial and retail demand. Separating industrial and retail demand is hard and not something fully respecting spot pricing because all that data doesn't flow back up to them and they're not trading physical anyway, they're doing the paper trade. So spot and retail uh, supply and demand and industrial supply and demand are not interconnected and they're not, the spot is not a function of those. Industrial markets will set up privately between big players a lot of times, and retail markets will set up privately between distributors and buyers, for example, you. Now, the reason I keep emphasizing you is you guys are about 50% of the equation. And when you, I mean retail or industrial demand, demands 50% of the equation. Every transaction has supply and demand. So the decisions you make 
uh, in your market affect the premiums you're going to pay the next time you go into that store or that whether or not your store is open or goes belly up and what products are able to produce because they're able to mint cool new stuff. So you are as much a function of the market as the guys delivering the metal. And that has to be taken into account as well. And that affects premiums. If you guys are buying more, guess what? Premiums go up. If all you guys want to buy American Silver Eagles at the same time, guess what? Premiums go up. Well, that's good for the people that bought before the premiums went up because then they can turn around and sell and make a profit or just feel good about what they have. What about the guys that bought at the top? And they get pissed off when the premiums crash back down, when demand crashes back down and they're sitting there with American Silver Eagles that they bought at $17 premium over spot. Now they can only get five to six when they're selling back or maybe one to two, depending on the market. So you really have to watch the premiums and you have to understand supply and demand. But supply and demand is a function of millions of distribution points, not COMEX and not the LBMA. Here's some information on silver premium history. The next few charts I'm going to give you are very data heavy and kind of hard. So you may want to pause at certain times to really stare at the charts. But this one is for um, different weights of silver from Monex and Bullion Star. So what we did here, actually, I didn't do it. It was um, a friend of mine who's in fintech who has a website, uh, exploringfinance.github.io, I believe, is the website URL. Exploringfinance.github.io. You can look at that on Google and find it. He's got a bunch of charts on the market. I'm just using his charts. I didn't compile this, but he basically has pulled from um, Bullion Star and Monex a bunch of data, and he's showing us what you know what the premiums are. Well, you, the first thing you want to know is that premiums rise when demand rises. Okay, demand affects premium, supply and demand affect premium. But during times of perceived crisis like 2020, when the shutdowns occurred, look at the premium spike across the supply chain for silver. And here we're looking at maple silver, uh, one ounce over a thousand ounce, 100 bars over a thousand ounce, a bunch of different products. And the different products get different premiums. So why the hell are American silver eagles or maples or government coins more expensive premium wise than the others? Because of supply and demand. Not everybody can afford a hundred ounce bar. Not everybody wants a generic one or 10 or five or 10 ounce bar. Most people want government coins. So those premiums are going to fluctuate more. Whereas in some of the less liquid products, they'll fluctuate less. Now, on the one hand, if you buy a lower premium product, that's good because you got in at less money. But it also means that there's less liquidity for it. That's why the premiums are lower. So when you go back to sell that, it may be harder. So the person that called me recently wanted to get rid of their 100 ounce bar, I said, that's not a very liquid market. You're, the buyback price on that's going to be lower than it is on other products. And I had to educate them as to why. There's less demand. You know, and I'm just, as a dealer, I'm a function of supply and demand just like anybody else. You know, I have to keep enough spread to pay the bills, keep the lights on not trying to get rich, but all dealers are the same way. But if you're buying a, buying and selling a hundred ounce bar, that market's less liquid than a one ounce generic round or a coin. That's just the way that it goes. And that explains why there's premium differences in products, even in the same market and across different markets within the U.S. Here's gold premium history. Basically the same thing, spike up in 2020 because of, you know, perceived risk. The interesting to know about gold and silver as you go through these charts, that the premiums have risen since 2020 and they're still higher than they were prior to 2020 even though they may go up or down and even in a relatively weak market the last six months for retail a bullion, the premiums are still higher than they were prior to 2020. Why? Because think about it. Supply overall went down because when, you know, prices were down so long, a lot of the mines closed, a lot of the, the distribution points, wholesales, retailers went out of business. There was less demand, but there was also less supply because there, there wasn't as much mine protection, particularly in silver. And so those things both affect the premium. So premiums are higher overall, both because of the supply in the market, but also the demand. But you also notice that for different products, uh, the premiums are different as well. And that's how that market works. And again, none of this is reflected in the spot price that is set on COMEX and in the UK. That's why premiums fluctuate. Premiums are the difference between the spot price, which has very little to do with physical trading and the actual physical trade. That's what premium is. It's a measure of the market's valuation uh, the metal is relative to the spot price, which doesn't get all that data, and they don't know what you want to buy and sell at. Here's different gold product premiums for both Bullion Star and Monex. And you can see that uh, in general, the things that are higher premium are going to be things like the government coins, the buffaloes, the eagles, and the maples. And in general, the premiums are lower on things that have less demand uh, for generic ounces, bars, and those types of things. And both these charts basically point that out. So that's why you pay more for American silver eagles because you demand them more. And also because they're produced, they're, they're a limited market by the U.S. Mint. Only one place sells them, the U.S. Mint. And if they don't produce enough and demand rises at the same time, those premiums blow out. 
And it's not just people gouging you, the wholesalers and dealers. It's a function of what you guys want versus a function of what we can get in the supply chain. In the case of American Silver Eagles or Canadian Maple Leafs, they're artificially limited by the amount that the mint is going to produce. And the mint doesn't always know what you're going to demand. So the mint can produce so many and you demand more, the price goes up. The demand, the, de the mint floods the market, premiums come down. It's just the way that it happens, but it's a function of both you, the buyer and the mint, the producer. Now the generic coins, bars uh, in larger sizes or smaller sizes tend to have lower premium at all times than the government coins because there are more outlets that can produce them. It's not only authorized by one outlet. There's multiple outlets. You could have a regional mint producing it. You could, you know, have somebody doing a custom pour in their backyard. Um, you know, you could have thousands of different people producing those more generic types of things and why the premiums are lower. But that also means when you sell back, you're probably going to get less premium back. That's just the way that that works. Uh, here's the same thing for silver. You'll notice in 2020, of course, premiums blow out and they're higher for every product because of those supply demand characteristics I talked about before. Because there's less overall supply specifically of silver because we're in a shortage between what's mined every year the last four years and what we're using both industrial and retail wise. So silver tends to have more volatile premiums in addition to being more volatile in spot. And so silver is really a highly speculative market if you're going to trade it short term, which is why I don't recommend it in silver. Gold tends to be more price stable over time because more gold is sitting in coffers and use, is used less industrially and there's more profit to the miners and there's more overall supply relative to demand. Silver is more volatile because um, that market, there's less supply relative demand, both industrial and retail, and um, there are more market participants. So that thing moves around a lot more. It's more volatile in terms of premiums and in pricing. Now, we did were able to scrape some data for the last 20 years on silver rounds. And you notice again in 2020, premiums on everything got expensive, including silver rounds, because demand and up, well, supply went down, particularly in silver. Now, in gold, it's less so. There's a little bit more stable supply in gold than silver the last four to five years. But in silver, you can really see that the premiums blow out because there's less available supply relative to overall demand. And there's more demand for silver because more people can afford silver. And what happened in 2020? The shutdowns. Shut down the mine supply, but also shut down the economy. So you have a little bit less supply that's now just ramping up. It takes years. But you also have a lot more demand because of why? Uncertainty in silver is the poor man's gold, what more people can afford. So that's why the premiums, both as a, an overall rate and a percentage rate, went up in 2020 on silver. So that's why you're paying more for that. So here's some conclusions that we have on premium. Premiums are sufficient to sustain the overall supply chain from miners to dealers about 20% of the time, the Pareto principle. The other 8% of the time, we're just surviving or losing and we're going through consolidation. We're going through winter periods. Both demand and supply affects premiums. So you can't just blame your dealer. You're buying from the dealer. You're part of that equation. It goes both ways. And it also has to do with the supply through the entire supply chain all the way back to the miners and what's available and what's available in the product that you specifically want. So both uh, industrial and retail demand affect the supply chain and the supplies. It is a, a market that's trying to price things and it can be a slow moving market from a supply perspective, but a very fast moving market from a demand perspective. So that's why a lot of times the demand changes really fast and the supply doesn't change as fast. And it causes a lot of variation in premiums and in rates. And that can change depending on the town you're in. I'm in Dallas, Fort Worth. We have a lot of residents. We have a lot of um, uh, refineries and mints and public outlets so that it's kind of easier sometimes to get access to stuff. So sometimes you get pricing advantages in a big market like this. What if you're in a smaller market and it's harder to get product there and there are less people demanding it? You may have more price inelasticity, meaning prices could fluctuate even more on certain products. So there's a very local component to this. Plus, a lot of things are produced locally. A lot of mints are local. A lot of mints are, you know, only service regional. And so that supply and demand of various products across different localities is different. That's why you can have different rates at different dealers across the country. That's why you can have different rates even at the big guys online, because it is a very localized and regionalized market. And that's jack squat all to do with spot. Spot's determined in one place in the U.S., in the COMEX. And they're not even getting all this retail data, so they don't know. You know, they just don't know and they don't control it. And that's why you'll get premium differences in different shops and different towns and different products. That's the way the market's supposed to work. And spot people, they say it's a commodity and it should always be the same. Don't understand the supply chain. And they don't understand that paper derivative pricing has very little to do with the physical. So spot is not physically derived. It's derived by paper and has nothing to do with your regional and local markets. Period. End of story. And if there's nothing else I want you to get from this presentation, it's that. It's also impossible to predict what demand will be. 
on large time scales, you can kind of get an idea through technical charting and understanding of economics and uh, those all these factors. You can guess at it and maybe you'll have the direction right. As to the strength of move of the direction and exact timing, it's very difficult. And the supply chain is very slow to change. That's why sometimes you'll see American Civil, Silver Eagles get up to $17, $20 in premium. Because sometimes the supply chain can't deal with retail demand. And that could also be true on the big industrial bar side. If you're not having enough uh, supply put into the chain, but all of a sudden Samsung and Apple need a bunch more silver, you know, or the central banks are buying a bunch more gold, it could take years for that supply to ramp up. And so that's going to affect uh, availability products and premiums as well. Most wholesalers and dealers cannot afford to hedge on the markets. It's too expensive to buy a contract for a small guy. And the big banks can do it all day long. They're worth trillions of dollars. But us small guys out here, it's too expensive. And it's very hard to get a trading account. And you have to have the specialist who understands that market to do it. And there are sharks in that market. And if you're a small guy, you can get eaten alive with the way the sharks play the market. So if they can't afford to hedge on it. One, because the, the, the cost of the contract is prohibited, but two, because they're most likely going to have their lunch eaten if they try to get in it anyway. So it's very hard to hedge at a local or even a mint level uh, your prices, unless you're a huge mint like the U.S. Mint or somebody like that. And you're going to use the banks to do your hedging for you. Premiums on individual retail products are largely determined by retail demand, which is hard to predict. And sales data is a combination of national, which we have some data, and local, which we have very little data on what's going on. So that's why we don't always know the direction of where the premiums are going to go. You can kind of look at spot on technical charting and have an idea, even though a lot of times you're going to be wrong because unforeseen events happen, which affect it. But on the retail level for retail products, it's very difficult to know what supply and demand is because nobody, not everybody's publishing their numbers. And that's why you have discrepancies in price quite often. All right. Likely outcomes moving forward of the overall trends we've seen the last 15 years dating back to the last crisis. There is an incentive to move retail customers to higher premium products to enhance profits during lean times. Moving you over to higher premium products like American Gold and Silver Eagles, American Buffaloes, uh, moving from generic products to, to government mint coinage, um, um, uh, getting into storage if you don't necessarily need it. Um, and it's all an individual choice as to what you want to do. But just be aware when we're in lean times and gold and silver uh the salesmen may you know need to make more money and they may offer you these other things and it's up to you to understand that market and decide whether you want to get into it there are also incentives to consolidate distributors wholesale and retail to control volumes and therefore premiums think about the amark example if all the companies did what amark did and you have four or five big guys controlling the entire market what can they do they can control supply they can control premiums they can control price so if we continue to have winter periods in the gold and silver space it's going to naturally lead to more consolidation, just like it would any industry, the auto industry, the farming industry, any industry. That gold and silver are not uh, are not impervious to that. Uh, retail buyers must educate themselves on pricing and products and also choose their retailers wisely. Let me give you an example. Let's say you only use the big online boxes. Well, you give them all the volume. What do they do? They control price and availability and what they, they buy back from you. Sometimes it's good to have more outlets. So sometimes going to your local coin dealer can help. And I'm not saying that just because I am a local coin dealer. Obviously, you're going to think that. But the more distribution points you have, the more chance you have of actually getting the product that you want at the price that you want, even though there will be differences in price. Because in like saying Dallas-Fort Worth, you can call 10 guys and get a read on the market and know what you're doing. And that can take you a couple of hours. And you can use that going forward. Well, what if you only have four or five guys doing all the supply? You can only shop three or four places and there's more incentive for them to fix prices. And then what do you do? There's less democratization of prices. And they may not want the product that you want at the price you want to sell it if you're going to sell it back. So it's not necessarily good. So choose your retailers wisely. It's okay to order from the big box guys, but throw your local coin dealers a bone there to keep that market uh, open to a lot of distribution points so that you have a lot of choices. You don't want just one grocery store in your area. You want five or six. You don't want just one auto dealer in your area. You want five or six. You don't want just one movie theater in your area. You want five or six. Choice. Okay. That helps all of us. Premiums are often a flashpoint topic for the retail public who may not realize that their buying patterns are part of the equation or 50% of the equation. Sorry, you can't see that. My logo is in the way. But the, the buying patterns of industrial retail are 50% of the determination of future market trends and prices when we're talking spot plus premiums. Not just spot, but spot plus premiums. So you guys also help determine that. So buy your products accordingly to what the market is pricing them at because you're 50% of the equation. Conclusions, and this will be the end of the presentation. Spot, well, I'll, I'll summarize at the very end. 
Spot price is a market anachronism that has little to do with retail supply and demand dynamics. I think we proved that with the presentation. And I talk about it every Tuesday when you when you go over the week of the market wrap ups. Spot price was originally for industrial hedging, which accounts now for about one tenth of one percent of actual industrial trade on those markets when we're talking physical deliveries. And that's what hedging is, hedging uh, market price to a physical product. Premiums as a percentage of spot are somewhat predictable at times only, but also very widely across an industry priced in millions of different outlets. And they can jump up and surprise you when the market gets frothy and you've got a lot of activity going on. Premiums can spike. It happens. Supply is slower to move than demand. Demand is the lever that grabs that premium and drags it up. And who are the demanders? Well, it would be you, ladies and gentlemen. Premiums are largely a function of total demand, but also influenced heavily by local markets. So you can have discrepancies in local markets. This is not unlike oil, groceries, autos, houses, et cetera. Beware of scams designed to take advantage of a lack of available data. Know what you're getting into when you sit down and you get into buying the product. All right. To some, the, the spot price that you see that's determined on that paper market has bupkis to do, especially with your local supply and demand trade. Premiums are a function of local and regional supply and demand. They're also a function of the overall supply and demand in the market. Industrial can affect retail and vice versa. Heavy retail can affect what the industrials can get in supply. Industrial demand can affect what the retails can get in supply. Especially with retail products, there are millions of different combinations. And dependent upon how many buys are for a specific product can be the premium for that specific product. And in a given area, let's say there's only one mint in a given area producing generic rounds. Well, guess what? Generic round premiums are going to go up. Okay. But if there are 20 uh, mints producing generic rounds in a given area, uh, just because of supply, it's going to come down. Okay. And on our artificially uh, limited government minted products like maple leaves, Kruger Ands, American Gold and Silver Eagles, those tend to have a limited supply at all times. And when the market really wants them, those prices can vary very widely. Think about it. One person producing American Silver Eagles, that's why the premiums fluctuate so much because you have a, a buttload of demanders, millions of de potential demanders, but only one outlet producing. But if you're talking about generic rounds, you may have 5,000 outlets producing for those millions. So they're able to supply at cheaper premiums more consistently on a graph, those types of products than they are American Gold and Silver Eagles. So be careful if you get an American Gold and Silver Eagles. If you buy at the right wrong time, you may pay too much premium and you may have to sit on for a long time and not feel good about it. And it's okay if you don't, I'm not, I'm not saying don't buy that. Just be aware of how that market works. And understand that local and regional factors definitely do influence the markets more than what you think. And so the spot price is a starting point for everything, but it's even a crappy starting point because all of that demand data from retail and from industrial doesn't flow back to the traders. And they're trading a two to three a month contract just to get pennies on the dollar. A lot of times they're to protect against one part of the market without having visibility in the whole other part of the market. So those spot prices really are a bad starting point. And premiums are a way to try to bring that market into equilibrium with supply and demand around a bad starting pro a price and spot. And that explains all of the stuff that goes on, why stuff moves around a bunch and you can go to one place and one get a different price, go to another place, get a different price. That's why that explains all of that. So this market really isn't super efficient at pricing, to be honest with you. Uh, there's probably better ways to do it. That being said, this is the market that we have. Hopefully that explains it to you guys. Uh, a lot of you guys will understand this. I mean, you may not. That's okay. It's complex. It's crazy the way that it all works, but that's the way that it works. Uh, hopefully this video is beneficial to you guys. I spent a lot of time creating it. Uh, we're at 50 minute mark me explaining it. Imagine how many thousands of hours I've been studying this market to be able to bring that explanation to you <laughs> a lot. So hopefully you guys got a benefit from that. If you do like subscribe, all that good stuff. And we'll see you next time on Gold Silver Pros. And you can visit us online at www.goldsilverpros.com. Thank you.